Hello, this is Jake Abbott. Uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about discrete systems. We've been, at this point in the sequence, we've learned about state space equations, which are sets of linear time varying or linear time invariant first order differential equations. Uh, we've also talked about, very briefly, about the transfer function, which is a way you can think about input output mappings of these uh, linear systems using Laplace transforms. Um, in this class, unlike other classes like you might take like a classical controls class rather than doing everything in time domain and then sort of at the very end thinking about how to describe things in discrete time using things like a Z transform which you may have seen um, in this class we're going to handle discrete systems right along with the continuous time systems um, they end up being the mathematics in in the state space controls formulation ends up being very s similar between the two so we can just handle discrete systems as we go along. So when I say a discrete system, what I'm really talking about now is something that looks like this. We still have, it's a very similar form. We have an x vector, but instead of an x dot vector, we're going to be analyzing our, our state vector x at some k sample, at k plus 1, basically meaning the next sample. And that's going to equal some matrix A times our state vector at sample k, and I'll talk in a minute about what this sampling means, plus b times our input vector at sample k, and it's typical to use square brackets here instead of sort of parentheses, it's just a convention, and then we'll have our output vector y at sample k is equal to c x at k <coughs> plus d u at k. So in a lot of ways this looks very similar to the time varying case that we saw earlier. Um, again, I've made my A, B, C, and D matrix matrices be constants, which means this is really an LTI system I'm looking at, a linear time invariant system. But we could consider linear time varying systems in which A, B, C, and D would also be changing as a function of the sample K. So I say the sample k here, and what does this mean? <clears throat> in discrete systems, unlike continuous time systems, we don't think about our signal, our x's and our u's and our y's, evolving over time in a way that you could get a continuous time-varying plot like this, where you have, you have time and then you have some signal that's sort of smoothly evolving over time. <clears throat> Instead, we think of things being updated in very discrete units. You can still think of them as instants of time, but now, instead of varying continuously, maybe k represents a year. Maybe this is a financial model, and you have, a, you have an interest that's, that's updated once per year. So it basically says, what will the money in my account be next year at sort of sample k plus 1? And you say, it's whatever I have in my account right now times 1.02. That would be a 2% interest. Maybe k represents a quarter, though, and you have the same exact formula. You say my, my money in my account next quarter will be whatever's in my account now times 1.02, so I'm earning 2% quarterly. So I'm updating in samples. This also lends itself to think directly about computer code, because a computer doesn't really, as it's, as it's running through lines of code, it doesn't really think about time so much. <clears throat> it just says, when I want to calculate a given line of code, I just take the numbers that I have stored in my memory and I do my operation on them and then I store that new value in memory. And so discrete systems sort of lend themselves well to thinking about computer code. So in some regards, so th these k's are now instance instances and they're usually still instances of time but we have very much disconnected ourselves from from time. We can think about it without knowing um, how much time has passed from from k to k plus 1. Maybe it's been a year, maybe it's been a second. It's sort of, it doesn't matter. We can analyze how our system evolves without knowing that. Um, but the big difference here, of course, is that these are no longer differential equations. This is not an equation for x dot, but it's an equation for x at k plus 1. But if you think about what, a, what the state space equations are really saying, which is, how do my states evolve? That's what x dot told us. It says, how, does, how, is, how is x changing? That's what the dot is. It's derivative. How is it changing? And it's changing as a function of the, the current state values and the current input values. Well, we're still doing that here. We're still saying, how are our states changing? 
So we're saying, what will our states be next time? Well, that's a function of what they are right now and what the inputs are. So the state equations are very much still descriptions on how our states are evolving in time as a function of states and inputs. So in that regard, it's very similar. So these are the kind of systems we're going to be looking at in, in discrete time. And like I said, we'll just be analyzing these in, in parallel with our continuous time systems. So I think it would be interesting to sort of think about how one might formulate um, a state space formulation of a problem. So let's think, let's make up a toy problem. Um, I'm a principal of a high school <clears throat> and I want to keep track and try and model and predict what my enrollment of my high school is going to be. Okay, So I'm making up a problem here and I really I really have three grades okay so let's call state one the um, the number of uh, sophomores let's say I'm in a high school that has three grades sophomores juniors and seniors so x2 is going to equal the number of juniors and apparently I'm in England or something so I write juniors with a u uh, and then x3 is going to equal the number of seniors. And as the principal, let's say, I'm really interested in the total population of my school at any point in time. So the output I'm going to be interested in is x1 plus x2 plus x3. So that just the total population of my school at any given year. And then we have to have to think about what our inputs to this system are. Well, Let's say we have um, u1 is equal to the number of junior high graduates. Junior high graduates. So there's going to be a bunch of kids <clears throat> in any given year coming out of junior high, and those kids that are coming out of junior high are going to become sophomores of my school. Um, but they're not all going to come. There's going to be some percentage that leave. And so let's account, let's try and account for that. And let's say, let's say U2 is equal to the number of families with high school aged kids moving <clears throat> to the district. So there's sort of two ways that you can add <clears throat> add students to your school. You can have them coming up from the junior high, or you can have families move into your district. And 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 you two being negative would be families moving out of your district. <clears throat> and we'll just make the assumption. We'll just do a rough assumption that of all the families um, coming into your district or moving into your district or leaving your district, there's sort of an equal probability that if they have high school age kids equal probability that it's a sophomore or junior or senior year. Um, so, okay, we've got, I think we've got enough structure here to think about this. So let's clean this slide. So let's think of what the equation for our sophomores. Sophomores. So sophomores were our state x1. And let's think about x1 at k plus 1. So how many sophomores will there be next year? Well, there will be, it's basically u at u1 at k. So that's how many students are graduating from junior high this year will become sophomores next year. But they're not all going to, to come in. So we're going to have to put some percentage of how many kids from the junior high actually come to the high school. Some are going to move away. Um, oh, except we'll, we'll account for moving away in the, other, in the other number. So let's just think of sort of a dropout right here. But I think not very many kids drop out at, at at this age. So let's say this is like 0 0.99. So almost all of the kids who are graduating from junior high this year will become sophomores next year. And then we do have this influx of, of um, families moving in or leaving the area and we call that U2 this year. So how many how many people are moving in this year? And let's just say um, a third, a third of those families, sort of equal probability, that have high school age kids, a third of them will be will be sophomores. 
So now we have an equation for how many sophomores there will be next year. So what about juniors? So juniors next year is going to equal some percentage of the sophomores this year. So here's our sophomores this year. And what percent of sophomores do you think um, drop out and, and don't go on to juniors? Let's say 95% go on to becoming juniors. <clears throat> and then we also are going to have a third of the students who are moving in. So U2 represents this number of families with high school age kids that are moving in. And, a, and approximately a third of them, if they have high school age kids, approximately a third of them will be juniors. And so um, now we have sort of 95% of sophomores are going to move on to being juniors and 5% will drop out, let's say. And I think this is good. And then let's write our equation for seniors. And that's how many seniors will there be next year? And I think we could probably make some sort of similar number, let's say. So 95% of this year's juniors will move on to being seniors. And, and then another third of our families moving into the district with high, with high school age kids, a third of them will be senior age kids. And then um, we said we wanted our output to be the total population of the school. So at any, in any given year, so our output at year K is going to equal the number of sophomores that year plus the number of juniors that year plus the number of seniors that year. And so now we can start packing this <coughs> into our state space formulation for discrete systems. So sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and I'll just write this whole thing at sample k plus 1, is going to equal some big A matrix. And just like before, this is going to be a square matrix. <coughs> In this case, it's going to be a 3 by 3 square matrix. And then I have my my sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and this whole vector is at sample k, and I'm going to have, I have two, three states and two inputs, so I'm going to have a big 3 by 2 matrix here times my two inputs, u1 and u2 at sample k, and then let's figure out our governing equations. So x1 at k plus 1 is 0 0.99 times u1, 0 0.99, and it's 0 0.33 times u2, and it's not a function at all of the states. So 0, 0, 0. <clears throat> My equation for x2 next year is 0 0.95 of x1, and 0 0.33 of u2, and it's not dependent at all on x2 or x3. And then x3 is 0 0.95 of x2. And then 0 0.33 times u2. So we've packed our a, b, and our a and b matrix now. And then our <clears throat> output, which is simply the sum of the three states, this is going to be a 1 by 3 vector, x1 x2, x3, and it's just going to be 1, 1, 1, the sum of the three states. And I'm not even going to bother tacking on a D matrix, because in this problem, like in so many problems, it's just 0. We're not going to be really concerned about looking at our inputs coming out in our outputs. And then you can kind of sort of imagine what would have happened if we would have said um, in our senior year, not only do we have 95% of our juniors coming forward, but what if we would have said that in any given year, 5% um, of our sophomores skip a grade? So our sophomores are x1. So we could have made our equation more complicated and said 5% of our sophomores just become uh, seniors directly. And so we could have come in here now, and this, z this 0 here would have become a 0. 0.05. So you can see how making sort of changes to your equation changed this A matrix. And ultimately, it's going to be these A's and B matrices that describe how our system is going to evolve in time. So this is how you formulate discrete problems. 
And the, the cool thing about this, when you start thinking about these problems that at first don't seem like engineering problems, you can sort of start thinking about doing social engineering and financial engineering. I mean, if you're the principal of this school, think what this means. I mean, what would the, we talked about the zero state response and the zero input response. So what would the zero state response correspond to here? That would be a, a, a system in which at the beginning, all of my states are zero. So that would be like I'm opening a new school, like I've, I've built, I've, I've gone out to some development, I've built a new development where people are going to move to and I'm going to build a big school. And my school is going to be populated by people moving into the area. So I'll have this input U2 um, and there may be some junior high that feeds it, I'm not sure about that. But basically I have this input U2 but my state is zero and I could watch how my population of my school evolves over the first few years as I have people start moving into this area. What would the zero input response mean? So I basically start with some initial condition. I have a school population that's well established and I start making my inputs zero. Well, I mean, U1 equal to zero means you're not taking any more students from a junior high. It's almost like you're saying you've decommissioned your high school or something. And what would U2 being zero mean? It means you've got a bad economy and no one's moving to this neighborhood anymore. There's no net influx. There's no more growth. So that would be the zero input response. And you could say, if no one ever moves into this neighborhood again, and I start with some population, how will the population of the school evolve over time? Uh, so I, I'm hoping you're starting to see how these the tools that we learn in this class, you can think about more broadly than just um, mass spring damper systems and, and sort of mechanical systems that, that we might cover in sort of kind of simple engineering examples.